Hello, I'm Chris Grant, Chief Operating Officer of the Permanente Federation, an organization that represents the shared interests of eight Permanente medical groups, 22,000 physicians, and over 80,000 employees. These podcasts are designed to bring the most innovative leaders in healthcare forward in a casual setting. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Rich Isaacs, a dear friend who's a head and neck surgeon and oncologist. He currently serves as the executive director and chief executive officer of the Permanente Medical Group in Northern California and president and chief executive officer of the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group, as well as something near and dear to my heart, co-chief executive officer of the Permanente Federation. Good afternoon, Rich, and thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, Chris. You know, it, uh, we've known each other for over a decade in your role as PIC and on the board of directors of TPMG, and we spent a fair amount of time together over this last year as you have assumed the role of the CEO of all of those entities that I just described. I thought maybe we could just start a little bit casual here and learn a bit about yourself. Great. So where did you grow up? I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, a product of the 60s. And I grew up, I spent my youth in Michigan all the way through the age of 22. Grew up in suburban Detroit. My father was an OBGYN practicing at the university in uh, downtown Detroit. And that's where I was born. I have two sisters and a brother. Both of my sisters are now practicing physicians on the East Coast. My sister's an OBGYN. My younger sister is a physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor. I've got a younger brother who is an urban planner. Oh, wow. So how do you think that that upbringing in in Michigan and your family life surrounded by physicians helped shape who you are today? Well, growing up in the Midwest was was really fantastic. I loved the Midwestern style. We grew up just helping each other. I can remember uh, our next door neighbors. It snowed a lot, by the way. It did snow. I got really good at shoveling snow to help our neighbors. We had there was an older couple that lived right next door to us. And of course, hey, we, let, me, let me help them, help them get in and out of their driveway. Excellent. And, I, and I'm sure that that's where you also gained your early snow skiing uh, skills. I, I know that you spent many years on the Tahoe Donner Ski Patrol. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I learned how to ski in Michigan, which wasn't really mountains. In um, southeastern Michigan, we had these kind of um, man-made hills. I used to joke we would practice getting on and off of chairlifts. That's basically what we did. But when I moved west and I experienced Squaw Valley, I knew that I had arrived in a ski resort, which was unbelievable. Um, Joined the ski patrol to blend two passions. Love taking care of people, and I love skiing. So I, I worked as a ski patroller in the Tahoe area for about 10 years and had a great time with that. So, you know, you and I have a lot in common. Uh, we both joined uh, the Permanente Medical Group back in 1995. Both were early pioneers in, in information technology and in healthcare. And we both have children in medical school. So I know you have one daughter in medical school and another that's seeking a career. Uh, what advice have you shared with your daughters about entering the field of medicine? I think medicine is a wonderful career. It's probably the most noble profession. I have not encouraged my children to pursue it. This is something that they chose on their own, but I'm really proud of them. And I think that medicine provides just an exceptional opportunity in a career to help others and to also apply skill in problem solving and providing just the best care for others. Another area we have in common is a love of music, and I can't tell you how many times, Rich, you've pulled out your iPhone and you've said, you got to listen to this. So tell me what's playing right now on your iPhone, and what are you listening to these days? I grew up in Motown, so I love anything that came out of Detroit. So I love classic Motown music. I listen to a, a lot of 80s rock uh, on, on my phone, um, and my wife and I enjoy watching live music. So we go to concerts a fair amount. Just two weeks ago, I was able to enjoy Hall and & Oates and Train. Oh, and right. one concert was great. That's amazing. And show. last year I saw Tom Petty in Sacramento. It was a, a month before he passed away. Wow. It was an amazing concert. One of the last shows. That sounds yeah. incredible. Why don't we get down to a bit of business here? 
you joined the Permanente Medical Group in 1995. What attracted you to Permanente Medicine? Why here in Northern California and, and working within an integrated group practice? Well, I feel very fortunate that I found the Permanente Medical Group because I actually trained in New York City where I became an otolaryngologist, and I pursued a fellowship in advanced oncologic surgery and skull base surgery that was at the University of California, Davis. I initially thought I was going to move back to New York City where I did my training and be a skull base surgeon, microvascular surgeon for Cornell. But I fell in love with Northern California, and I got to meet the doctors that were working in Sacramento, the Permanente Medical Group. Um, they were hiring the best physicians that ever trained in the UC system, and that just was very attractive to me. It's where the best people wanted to practice, and I was honored that they offered me a position to come join them. And, that, and that's really where I was exposed to Kaiser Permanente because on the East Coast, I really didn't know what it was. I didn't understand what an integrated healthcare delivery system uh, represented. But once I joined the group in South Sacramento, it became obvious that working as a team uh, for the common goal of providing simply the best health care for the community was the right place for me. And, you know, I, I often hear you saying that Kaiser Permanente is the solution for health care in America. What are the main challenges that you see for American health care, and how are the Permanente Medical Groups and Kaiser Permanente prepared to address those challenges? Well, the concept of integration and prepayment is what differentiates our program from the rest of the world. We're rewarded for keeping people healthy as opposed to uh, managing fee schedules for taking care of the sick. We are rewarded when we keep our population healthy, and that's a big difference from what's happening in the rest of healthcare right now. People in my medical school class are in practice and fee-for-service medicine. And they're actually rewarded for doing more things. We, as the Permanente Medical Group, are rewarded when we keep patients healthy. So we're all aligned along this common mission to improve the health of our patients and the communities that we serve. For me, as a physician-in-chief in South Sacramento, when the hospital was half empty, I was excited. I think in Permanente Medicine, when you see one of our physicians and they make a recommendation, you know that they're making the recommendation that's in your best interest. If you see a physician outside of Permanente and they make a recommendation, how do you know? How do you know it's in your best interest or is it in their best interest? So I think that's a big differentiator for us and it's what inspires me every day to move our model forward. KP Health Connect is the largest private sector implementation of an EMR in the world. And back in 2005, KP South Sacramento Medical Center, you were the alpha site for Health Connect. In fact, I believe the implementation started literally the first weekend after you were selected physician in chief. Can you talk about the process, both in terms of how it changed the practice of medicine and also the change management that was necessary? Well, being the alpha site for Kaiser Permanente's implementation of EPIC was an honor, but also a tremendous responsibility. And I learned so much about leadership and change management because we were dealing with a very rudimentary system that we had the opportunity to help develop and help implement into our system. And it, I remember it started in pediatrics in our Elk Grove Medical Office building, and then it cascaded through every single department. It took about 12 months to do that with the ultimate implementation on the inpatient side. And it was the summer, it was a, it was a summer evening in June of 2006 when we turned the switch and we were fully integrated is an outpatient and inpatient electronic medical record system, the first of its kind in civilian medicine in the United States. Outstanding. That was really exciting. Uh, it, and and you, it's amazing when you turn the clock ahead now and you see what an impact it's had on our organization and also how really all of healthcare has followed suit. You know, one of the things that's been remarkable, having spent time with you, is when we, you know, toured the South Sacramento Medical Center, everybody knew you from the receptionist to the chief of the emergency room. 
when we went to dinner, uh, the, the waitress knew you, the restaurant owner knew you, but then I've also seen you in boardrooms, very decisive and taking command of the room. So I'm interested in how you keep that balance and how you would characterize your leadership style. Well, thank you, Chris. Well, I, I would say that I'm a transformative leader, and I understand how important the input of the folks that you're leading, how important their, their voices are. So I, I'm an inspirational leader that likes to engage the folks that are actually doing the work to help solve the problems that we're dealing with every day. And I bring a lot of high energy to most situations, and I'm a very uh, creative thinker. So if there's one way of doing something, I can probably find 10 other ways and try to inspire folks to help decide which is the best one. That's great. And and when you think about leaders, whether it's in the mid-Atlantic states or in the Permanente Medical Group here in Northern California, what are the characteristics of a leader that, that, that you look for? So I'm looking for leaders who have credibility. They have to be exceptional clinicians to lead other clinicians, first and foremost. We're moving into a very transformative time in healthcare. So the leaders who I'm selecting need to have a willingness to challenge the status quo. They need to have self-discipline. They need to have perseverance. And they need to have humility. And they have to have a willingness to try new things and not be afraid to take on some risk because of the potential of failure. Every innovative corporation, every innovator ever has always taken risk. And when you take risk, you know, you may fail sometimes, but it's okay because you learn from those. So for me, the job of a leader is not to prevent errors from happening, but to make it safe for your team to make errors because you learn from them and then you can be even better. I recall reading an article about you where you won an award called the Extra Mile Hero Award for performing a life-saving emergency tracheotomy that happened to be on Easter Sunday back in 2001. Can you tell me what happened that day and what your takeaway was regarding how medicine was practiced at TPMG compared to other settings? I was on call at Kaiser Permanente South Sacramento rounding on some head and neck oncologic surgical patients that I had in the hospital. I remember it was Easter Sunday, and at 7 in the morning, my pager went off, and it was the ER at Kaiser Permanente South Sacramento with a very unusual request. It was our ER physician. He said, typically don't call you to take care of patients at other hospitals. But there was a patient at Mercy Methodist, which was also in South Sacramento. And this was early on in my career. I had no idea where it was. And he said, there's a patient that needs an otolaryngologist's help. Would you be willing to go over there and help them out? I said, absolutely. Just tell me where it is. It's just down the road. So I literally dropped what I was doing and ran there. It wasn't just down the road. It was about a mile and a half. So I ran as fast as I could, got there. And when I walked into the emergency department, it was a very busy place. Lots of patients in the waiting room. And I got to the back. And in the back corner, there was a 22-year-old African-American woman, seven months pregnant, who was having difficulty breathing. She was actually leaning forward, and her tongue was um, being pushed out of her mouth from se severe swelling that she had. She basically needed a surgical airway. So they granted me emergency privileges. On the spot. On the spot. Got to go into the operating room. Um, under local anesthesia, was able to perform a tracheotomy. Wow! And stabilized her airway. She was, she was in duress. Mm -hmm. I don't think she had a lot of time. She was breathing very rapidly. Uh, she had angioedema. Her tongue, her lips, her whole face was incredibly swollen. The anesthesiologists were there, and they were unable to secure an airway the normal way. So that's why we had to do this tracheotomy. And I stabilized her airway. We transferred her back to the hospital bed, spent some time with her and her family. And then I, on my way back to Kaiser Permanente, South Sacramento, it was a, a mile walk, I couldn't stop thinking about how we almost lost this 22-year-old woman and her unborn child. And that was the moment that I realized that Kaiser Permanente is a special place. 
where you have an integrated healthcare delivery system with the best physicians. And that was the day that I dedicated myself to making Kaiser Permanente as good as it could be. That's outstanding. So let's bring the clock forward from 2001 to today. Just a year ago, you became the CEO of the Permanente Medical Group and the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group and the co-CEO in the Permanente Federation. Can you share some of your reflections about this past year? Well, it's been incredibly an exciting year for me. The transition from a charismatic, dynamic leader, Dr. Robbie Pearl, who has positioned Kaiser Permanente and the Permanente Medical Group to be a leader in, in the nation. And I feel very fortunate to uh, be able to work on the foundation that he and my other predecessors have developed to take Kaiser Permanente to the highest levels. It's been phenomenal. So as far as learnings go, I mean, it's a big job. I have 21 hospitals. I have 19 physicians in chief leading those medical centers. There's also three physicians in chief in the mid-Atlantic states, one in Northern Virginia, one in Washington, D.C., and one in Baltimore. So the scope of my new position is pretty vast, but it's been great because the Permanente Medical Group and the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group are just phenomenal groups that have attracted the best in healthcare. We're so well positioned to deal with whatever challenges come our way. When you have this collaborative group that can think creatively and solve any problem, no one can touch the Permanente Medical Groups. Let's turn the clock ahead and think about the future. What do you think are the biggest innovations coming in healthcare, and how well is Permanente prepared to adopt those technologies and, in fact, to lead them? It's going to be smartphone technology that allows us to provide high-quality care in the most convenient time frame for patients. So we're already doing this uh, better than anyone that I know in, in the communities around us where we're leveraging the technology. I just saw the data last month. Northern California Permanente did 2.2 million secure messages. These are patients that are reaching out to their personal physician with an issue or a question or looking for some feedback, and they're getting it almost instantaneously. And our doctors treat them very much like text messages. And our patients are getting immediate response from their physicians to help them. And then telemedicine. We're going to be using this technology to take images, teledermatology. The majority of dermatology today is practiced via smartphone technology. The future is going to be leveraging our excellence and using our electronic medical record systems. We have more longitudinal data than anyone in healthcare today. And we should be using that to help with predictive analytics and artificial intelligence to help develop the best systems to provide simply the best quality and convenient care for our patients and the communities into the future. Sounds like an optimistic and exciting future ahead. You know, when you think about the advancement of technology and information that's now at the fingertips of a physician. How do you think that's going to affect their clinical practice, and how do you keep it from becoming overwhelming? We, we have an obligation to ensure that we help our physicians provide the best care possible for a dynamic care delivery system. So as far as how do we manage the data, I think it's really about providing joy and meaning for a physician who's practicing. And what gives me the most joy is when I can focus on the patient-physician relationship, having the time to actually have a relationship with a patient. That's really where we have to be. And currently, healthcare in this country is struggling because of the data. So we're working on some things in Northern California and the Mid-Atlantic states that focus on creating joy. How do we take the things that physicians shouldn't be doing off of their plate and letting systems take care of that? Having um, medical assistants or cashier receptionists or ancillary providers practicing at the top of their license so that the physician can practice at the top of theirs. So there's a lot of things that we're working on right now that are really, really exciting. 
that we can leverage the technology to help physicians be physicians and help the systems support their job. And as, as both uh, a leader of 22,000 doctors and the dad of future doctors, um, really designing a, a care delivery system and tools that make it manageable for physicians in a, in a balance uh, in their lives is critically important. Absolutely. And just watching my oldest daughter finish her first year of medical school inspires me even more to dig in and come up with all of these innovative approaches to care delivery because I want her to be a permanente physician and to experience all of the wonderful things that we're about to create. Dr. Isaacs, I want to thank you for your time today. I want to thank you for your leadership. I've been inspired by what you've achieved and accomplished over your 25-year career here, and I can't wait to see what happens over the next decade. Totally a pleasure. Thank you so much, Chris Grant. Enjoyed it. Well, this has been such a pleasure. That's our show for today. Thanks for listening to the Permanente Podcast. You can find and download our podcast by visiting permanente.org. See you next time.